Ray, I, like you, have struggled my entire life trying to understand consciousness. And much of what I've done intellectually, it has motivated me. Let's start at basics. What is consciousness? The question, what is consciousness, is not as basic as it sounds, and it's a much contested area. But I would like to have affirmative action for the ground floor of consciousness, qualia. These are sensations, feelings, feelings of warmth, feelings of cold, sense of brightness, and so on and so forth. This is the ground floor of consciousness that many philosophers' consciousness try to ignore or to eliminate, because it is the most difficult part of consciousness actually to assimilate into a materialist world picture, into the idea that consciousness is due to brain activity. But that's just the ground floor. There are many other of the aspects of consciousness, particularly in human consciousness, and obviously beliefs, memories, thoughts, and so on, as well as emotions. All of these are aspects of consciousness. But the important bit that you mustn't, as it were, lose is the, the ground floor, the basic stuff, the qualia. Now, some philosophers will eliminate that by claiming that consciousness is an illusion. We have different uh, uh, afferent uh, uh, sensations, uh, vision, sound, tactile, internal memories, and these are all sort of competing in our brain, and they give us the illusion of consciousness because all of these are flowing in, and we think we have this unified pattern. Consciousness can't be an illusion, of course, because to have the illusion of being conscious is being conscious. I mean, this is just a variant, basically, of Descartes' cogitative argument. But the, the things they tend to regard as illusory are ground floor bits of consciousness, like qualia, or even items such as beliefs and thoughts and so on. They think that these items belong to a folk psychology that a science of consciousness will eventually do without. But their attempts to get rid of these things seems to me have proved entirely unsatisfactory. Well, why do so many uh, first-rate philosophers then uh, believe that? Uh, they eliminate the concept of consciousness, and once they do, of course, then it's very easy to associate brain states with, uh, with the mind. I think they make the fundamental and very common error of confusing methodological limitations with uh, an account of what is there. If you can't measure something, or if you can't subject it to scientific investigation, so they feel, then it doesn't really exist. But that, of course, is nonsense. To argue that something as fundamental as the feeling of warmth that I'm having now doesn't exist is a pretty desperate remedy to try and include all of consciousness within the methodological limitations of scientific psychology. Well, I, th I think what they do is they say that, yeah, you have these feelings, but you have the feeling that there's a central actor inside that is having these feelings, when rather they are happening by themselves, and as they do in, uh, in, in sequence, we're, we're only sensing a, a very small part of what's happening. Most of what's happening is, psych, is subconscious, or, 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 or uh, uh, we're only attending to one thing, and there's so many things happening. So we have this, this illusion that we're in charge of what we're doing, and it's really different brain states that are competing for this. Certainly there are many things that underlie my moment of consciousness of which I'm unconscious. Just when, for example, I go for a walk to the pub, I'm not conscious of all my muscles contracting, even less am I conscious of the molecular events that are happening in my muscles to make it possible for me to walk to the pub. It doesn't mean to say that I'm not really walking to the pub. So in other words, I'm, I'm not in a state of illusion to believe that I'm doing that. It's just that there are many mechanisms upon which my voluntary action Depends. The focus of the illusion is not the muscularity and the many thousands, if not more, things that are going on that you're not aware of, but it's the I. It's the, the, the illusion of the I that senses that. Mm. That's the illusion. It's interesting that those who cried to dispose of the I are quite remarkable egos themselves. But even rather non-egocentric characters like David Hume ran into a lot of trouble when they tried to dispose of the, of the I. When you think of the famous passage in his treatise on human nature, and he says, when I look into the flow of my consciousness, I see a succession of perceptions, yes. but I don't see anything corresponding to I. Right. That sentence has got at least three instances of I in it. <laughs> so clearly the I that is David Hume is a real thing, but it isn't just a mere percept, and it isn't just a particular mechanism in the brain. It isn't a, a CEO, as um, Daniel Zanette would say, uh, acting within consciousness. It is something that is diffusely but really present. Let's go into it. What does that mean, diffusely but re really present? It sounds like if you go too diffuse, it's not really present. 
a lot of things are diffuse and real. The, my sense of the world around me is pretty diffuse, but it is inescapably real. But this I that I am is an absolutely fundamental intuition. It isn't something that is reducible to anything else. That I am, and that I am this, this person currently talking, uh, this body from which I'm talking, is something that I, I cannot, without self-refutation, deny. Yeah. I'm not sure that self-refutation ref refutes the refutation of the I, if, if that made any sense. Uh, be, because uh, I'm not sure a logical flow of those words, because we're, we're using them, uh, is a legitimate um, uh, a reason for saying that that I exists. Because producing that thought could have been this combination of different brain states that, that uh, engendered that. But my speaking here today is part of a biography which makes sense to me, which I um, have a large part in bringing about. I wouldn't be here today if what I was doing didn't make sense in terms of my larger biography. You, in fact, my simply being here talking to you draws on the four quarters of my consciousness, my long-standing interests, my um, projects, my particular interest in philosophy and so on, all of those things are drawn upon in this minute. This moment in which we're talking together wouldn't make any kind of sense if it wasn't drawing upon the sense of I that has both temporal depth and extraordinary extension at any particular time. If I would agree with everything you said, what would that mean about this I? Well, it wouldn't mean that the I is a thing. Uh, not for a moment do I think that the I is a kind of thing, nor do I think it's a persistent reiteration of something like I think that Kant spoke about. The I is rather, as I've indicated it, as something that has temporal depth, that is inseparable from its biography and from the world which makes sense to it and to which it makes sense.